can use technology as always. And today I decided we are going to talk about prayer. Now, remember a few weeks ago, uh, uh, Professor Mujer. Yes, he did a sermon on prayer. That kind of made me think. And I decided, let me continue kind of his thoughts. And he was mostly talking about what is the reason of prayer to be answered? And I was practically doing, even that I didn't talk to him, but I hope he will forgive me. If he does another sermon on prayer, it's still okay. But before we talk about prayer, let's pray, of course. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the opportunity to be here, that we have a chance to get together to worship you. And we ask for your blessings and understanding of the things that we will look through today. Help us have a better understanding of what prayer means, how important it is for us, and um, maybe get some more insights on it so we can have a better Christian life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, you may have seen a different spelling but in the bulletin. But interesting, I got the two spellings right in different places. So first, let's go to the perseverance. Perseverance. And it's uh, very interesting. It also means persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. And um, why I decided I've been interested in uh, prayer, I've been watching a lot of sermons, a lot of preachers, a lot of stories. And before we kind of explore some of the biblical context on why persistence, it's just because it relates to delay in achieving success. And I found out that all the prayers that are being answered in the Bible or even in recent times are really a result of persistent prayer, of prayer that is actually beyond what we think it's persistent. And um, I can start with the survey, and that's an Adventist survey. I found, which is kind of the sample size is not that high. And I didn't put it in there on a slide because it's, it's just a small about how many Adventists pray daily. And that's small sample size, about 200 people. But I found another sample size of all Christians that's in America that supposedly, you know, how often they pray. That's from Pew Research. Maybe you know this website. It's kind of popular. PewResearch.org. And it shows almost similar results. So uh, I will tell you the information here that it is. So um, related to the Adventist church, that it's almost the same with the rest of the Christians who pray daily. From age 18 to 29, 26%. Only pray daily. 30 to 49, 35%, and that's the highest. From 50 to 64, 17%, and 65 and higher, 22%. So if you look at the average, think about it 26, 35, 17, 22. So it's about 25. If you draw a line in the middle, you will see 25% actually of Adventists, and that's very common for the rest of the Christians pray daily, but uh, what we're gonna see today, and I'm gonna tell you a few stories first, that uh, even praying daily, it's not enough to have an answer prayer. It's not just daily, but consistently praying for a specific thing. So uh, one of the stories, because that's kind of gonna show you a little bit of the context of what we think of persistent prayer is my own story. Uh, before I became a Christian, the first church that actually I became a member of um, was two to three years after the communism fell in, the, in Bulgaria, Eastern Europe. If you don't know where it is, it's very close to Ukraine now. If you look at the map of Ukraine, you probably have seen Romania, Bulgaria on the south, Black Sea on the east. So what happened there is that there was a seminar, and of course, we are students went there we, we've been introduced to the bible from friends and uh, colleagues there at the university and the city there was a university town it's almost like bloomington way smaller probably half half the size of bloomington normal and we of course lots of students get baptized we joined the church 
And later on, I realized when I saw how many young people that actually there was a young member of the church who was a son of some of the church families. And of course, the church was about 150 people. He was praying years before that. As soon as the communism fell, he found and he realized all the young people in the church are the ones that are families of the church members. So he said, I'm going to pray. So he prayed one month, two months, three months. Eventually, he kind of forgot nothing was happening. But two years later down the road, so he was praying around 1991, the seminar happens. And now so many young people get baptized. And he just wanted young people in the church. That at some point when we were uh, doing, because we joined, the, we had a youth group and we had to have a youth board meetings. I mean, you you would think that that doesn't exist, but in big churches probably. So from 150 members, the church went to about 200, 250, half of these. So at some point, 50, around 50 young people were the new members of the church. So he realized that later that actually it was a result of his prayer, consistent, persistent prayer, at least for a specific amount of time for months that actually allowed this to happen. Another story, you may have heard some of those, but I'm going to mention them because they're good context. Is a story of uh, from the uh, Maranatha mission. I don't know if you watch Maranatha mission stories. So one of the Maranatha mission stories was about, I mean, many of the stories they share, it's about churches that are being built in different countries. So this country is Central America. I forgot the, the name. It's not Panama. It's not Venezuela, it's not Colombia, I remember. It's not Belize, I just don't remember the country, but it's Central America. And there is this woman, and it's some of the, um, it's not really an, I don't think it was an island country, but it's a, um, it was a equatorial country in that area. It's not uh, one of the big ones, it's not Brazil. So um, some people start coming to churches and uh, you know, their churches there are so, small and uh, they were practically meeting in a, a shelter it's like there are no walls they have just um, a roof with the pilot holding on and becomes so crowded and you know because it's small that people when it rains because you know it's a uh, equatorial country you know tropical it rains a lot and during sabbath people actually have to stand outside with umbrellas so she prays she starts praying for God, please give us a chance to expand the church or at least have a building that's a little bit bigger so at least people don't stand on the rain. So she can start praying. She prays one week, two weeks, three weeks, one month, two months, three months, six months. He forgets. At some point, she stops praying because nothing is happening. She forgets. The next year, she receives um, information that actually Maranatha has agreed to come and build one of those one-day churches. They are just uh, bigger. They build them in one day. They just make a structure, right, with the metal or wood. And they put, sometimes they put walls, sometimes they don't. So later on, when the church, when the Maranatha came and built the church, she realized that that was just an answer because the way she, she figured that out is that the way she was praying, it was the exact answer of her prayers that she was doing a year before. One more story. And uh, I don't know if you've heard those. I mean, I can give you more, but let's do at least one. That's a, that's a good one. And um, I don't know if you know the name Pavel Goya. He's, the, uh, he's from the ministry department in the general conference. And he talks a lot about prayer. So he goes all around the world. He gets invited on, uh, and to speak on a prayer. So he goes to uh, um, Madrid, Spain, in Europe. So I don't know, maybe there is a Madrid in, in America. There are so many. I know there is Vienna in America, but it's not in Austria. So um, he goes to Madrid in Spain and he does a seminar. He goes home and uh, uh, years later in 2014, so that's like 10 years, 2014, he receives a call from the conference there in uh, Italy. It's very interesting. So this seminar that he did was in Spain, 2004. And she's 
this phone call from Italy, from the conference, that telling him what happened, just to give him like an update, why this thing is so important. So what happens in Italy, the church is very small. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a Catholic country. The interesting thing is not many Christians, even though there are lots of Catholics on the books, uh, there are not many Adventists, about 2000 Adventists. So in the city of Milan, so that's somewhere south, the city of Milan, the church is only 40 people. So that's a big city, but still 40 people membership. One church, 40 people membership, only 16 attending. And the youngest member, 80 years old. So um, what happened there is exponential growth. And the conference is trying to figure out what we can do to replicate this growth. And uh, of course, we as Adventists always thinking it's programs, 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 right? And this has become like a, in our society that we live in. It's not just in America, in Europe, it's everywhere. We have phones, we know everything to ping and ding and happening now, um, live. We always want things to be live. The news is before they happen. We show you, you know, if you've seen those advertisements, we show you the news before they happen. Wow, it's not even news yet, but it's already live. And this is penetrated into the church. So they try to figure out what these people do. The youngest member, 80 years old or 81 years old, younger person, and they start talking to that woman. And um, she tells them she went to Madrid 10 years later and listened to that seminar. She recorded on her phone, not video, 2004. The video was kind of scarce on phones, but she recorded audio. And she went home and she started praying. So 16 people attending in the church, she started praying. She just first decided to God, wake me up early in the morning and I'm going to pray for one hour. I mean, retired person, yes, hey, why not? I'm free, you don't need to go to work. She prays one week, two weeks, three weeks. Nothing special happens. She decides that um, she needs to, for somehow she gets an impression, I need to write, transcribe all these things from the audio that she wrote and she sends them to um, all the people in the church. And two, three weeks, a month later, suddenly her children, they don't even wanna to talk to her that live in Spain. Suddenly they start calling her. They start asking her, how are you doing? Few months down the road, they start going to church and she hasn't done anything. She doesn't tell them anything. She doesn't tell them go to church. She doesn't tell them read your Bibles. She just prays. The rest of the young folks on the church, which are actually older than her, start praying. And uh, they decide to meet at the church early morning. The neighbors see that it says, I thought you guys only meet together on Sabbath, you know, once a week on Sabbath. And she says, no, we just have a prayer meeting. And then he tells them, Okay, can you pray for my wife? Because she's a stage four, I think is the last stage cancer. Stage four cancer, I'm gonna, I need your prayers. Um, we are not hoping that anything is gonna work, but just if can, God can extend her life. So they start praying two, three weeks there and the church also, they say, okay, she's four stage can cancer, what, what can happen? I mean, those people, you know, at four, fourth stage cancer usually sent home and they, just left to die. I mean, whatever God has given them, they, they are just waiting. So two, three weeks down the road, they go for checkup. Cancer has cleared. The woman is fine. Older woman, of course. The husband says, we want to join your church. And uh, they say, but we meet on, on Sabbath. He said, I don't care if you meet on Tuesday. I want to <laughs> I want to come to your church. They join the church. The next neighbor asks him, what happened to you? Why are you going to church on Sabbath? The, his neighbor, his children are in prison uh, for drugs, for, I don't know, bad crimes. Uh, it wasn't murder or anything like that. So they say, can you pray for my children? They start praying for the children. The children get released the same year, I believe, early for good behavior from prison. And nobody is telling them to go to church. Consider, this is just people praying. They are not inviting anybody to church. They're not telling them, read the Bible. They're not telling them, keep the Sabbath or you're not going to be saved. saved. Eat vegan or you're not going <laughs> to see heaven. Nobody's telling them that. Oh, you are not vegan? Oh, you're, please. Sabbath, don't you know? Sabbath, nobody's telling them that. 
they leave, they come, they join the church. Six months down the road, this church is, has 200 people. At some point, a year later, 350 people. They decide to, uh, because of there are so many people now in the church, three more churches get planted three years down the road, just because of this young lady, 81 years old, went to a seminar and decides to, to pray. So um, there are other stories, but I'm not gonna tell you. And to me, it's always a surprise me there. We can tell each other stories all day. Maybe that's more important, but what I uh, have figured out and we will see through the Bible is that why it takes so long. It's always, this question has always bothered me. It's why would God wait for so long? Why God wants such a long commitment? And why the delay? Why he doesn't respond? And we have stories in the Bible that God just can just say, okay, it happened. Or just believe what Jesus was saying. Just believe. Everything is going to be, your daughter will be well. Before you reach home, in the next hour, that's usually the Bible with Jesus time. In the next hour, the person is healed. The paralytic or the, the paralytic stands up right away. The people that were uh, the 10 lepers, while they were walking to show themselves to the priest. Okay, those are maybe extreme situations. And that's Jesus we are talking about. Even in his human body, even being connected with the father every night, every morning, having a relationship but why so much delay? And uh, when you start looking deeper, you will see that there is a cause for this. And I believe that the problem is that we forget what we are dealing with. And uh, that's what I wanted to explore a little bit today. And now uh, we have Job. I want to start with Job. And you already probably know where I'm going. Uh, we've mentioned it in our Sabbath school lessons. I'm not going to go through the struggles of Job, just mentioning stories from the Bible. And uh, I put the first two verses, but we can read a few more later. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come from? And why we like this book is because it's very clearly, it's one of the first books as much as we know, our archaeologically and all through other studies of the Bible, it's one of the first books written in the Bible, one of the oldest. It's like it really shows us what the situation is. We, we see a righteous man, and we can read a little later, a few more verses, but maybe three and four. Then the Lord said to Satan, okay, uh, still verse two, Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. It's like, so instead of Satan coming somewhere from the deep of the ground or the caves, whatever he may be living on earth, he's just walking to and fro, just passing almost like observing what's going on. And he says, then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job and there is none like him on the earth a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity. Although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. So Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a pot shirt with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. And we know what happens. That's in chapter one that his family dies in one day. So here very clearly see that there is a battle and there is something going on on earth uh, that is not right. 
It's like, it's not just when we pray and God's gonna answer their prayers. And the thing is, Job prayed for many, many days, or at least he was sitting and trying to figure out what is going on. Um, it's very interesting in the verses, I did not read it here, but um, that was in chapter one, I believe. The chapter one, there is another conversation when uh, it's very similar uh, and says, Satan answered the Lord and said, that's chapter one, verse seven, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. And uh, again, God says, have you considered my servant Job? So saying, well, does Job fear God for nothing? And verse 10 is a very interesting. Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side. And why this is very important, because we see there is a conversation, there is Satan who wants to harm Job. He wants to do something bad to him. And God says surrounding him with a hedge. And if you look different translations and um, looking at the verb actually in the different translation of what hedge means, that's really in the old days, it's something with sticks, like a poking sticks, sharp sticks around, or even today that we use barbed wire, especially when you see prisons, when you see places that someone should not cross, it has to be something pokey, so you cannot climb, you cannot grab on it. So that's a very good hedge. God has surrounded Job with a hedge, so there is a protection that Satan cannot harm the righteous people. So another story, Luke 4, 5 and 6. This is Jesus, you know, if you remember, he got baptized uh, by John the Baptist and the Holy Spirit takes him into the wilderness and then uh, to, so the devil to, that's previous verses, talks in Luke 4, so the devil can tempt him. So then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you in their glory, for this has been delivered to me. I give it to whoever I wish. So now we see Satan wasn't just walking on the earth. We see with Job, and there are many other examples in the Bible. You can think of other stories if your mind is working right now. But in this case, we will see that Satan actually has an authority on the things on the earth. He actually has been given to him because we know why. He deceived Adam and Eve. He was, Adam and Eve was evicted from the Garden of Eden and Satan practically, practically becomes the ruler of this earth and he has authority to give all the kingdoms to Jesus. So here is another kind of clue that we are getting that Jesus may not have the right and, and uh, God may have the right to put a hedge around us, but Satan has owns everything. He has the authority over it. So it's, if you start looking deeper, you will understand that there is something going on. There is something that you could do or Satan can do and something God can do. So if any one of you have been in the military or watched the movies, or anything, there is even I believe there was even a movie, very interesting kind of old movie with that exact title, Rules of Engagement, ROE. I don't know if you remember it. It was, uh, I believe Samuel Jackson. I believe Samuel Jackson plays there and forgot other actors. So it was a story about, it's not really war, but it was about an embassy in the Middle East. I forgot where it was, an embassy in the Middle East that they have to evacuate. So the government is suing, you know, the military court suing him because all of his group died. So he didn't actually follow the rules of engagement properly because there were people there, some from the country, it was a Middle Eastern country attacking the embassy and he had to evacuate the, uh, the members there of the embassy. And, but while during the evacuation was going on, they were, you know, killed, and um, the 
um, cases, it's very interesting to watch how exactly the rules of engagement works. But here is what I got of Encyclopedia Britannica. Military directives meant to describe the circumstances under which ground, naval, and air forces will enter into and continue combat with opposing forces. Formerly, rules of engagement refer to the orders issued by a competent military authority that delineate when, where, how, and against whom military force may be used. And they have implications for what action soldiers may take on their own authority and what directives may be issued by a commanding officer. So looking at these definitions and looking at stories when we only look to, do you think that there is, a, I mean, we know, we will read a verse later, but our battle is not against flesh and blood. We'll give you a few more examples. But do you think that there are certain rules of engagement in the this great controversy that still continues on earth where Satan can only do so much and God can only do so much just because there are rules of engagement. Now, interestingly enough, God didn't leave us exactly the rules of engagement in the Bible. He didn't say Proverbs chapter number by your choice, here are the rules of engagement. He didn't give them to us. He just gave us stories, but they exist. And like, let's look at a few more. Exodus 14, 19 and 20. That's the story when um, um, Israelites are running from Egypt. So this has happened. Just giving you a background because we are looking only to different stories. The places happened. They are walking through the desert and they are right in front of the Red Sea. And now Pharaoh, who has his son died, his firstborn son, the next Pharaoh is already dead. He was not going to, someone else need to be. The firstborn that was supposed to inherit the throne. He's now not just uh, with a hardened heart. He's furious. And of course, before that, the Israelites are grumbling. Oh, you brought us here to die. We are now blocked by the Red Sea in the front, on the back of the Egyptians with chariots, with horses, with weapons, with swords coming to destroy us. And Exodus 14, 19 and 20, the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel. So the angel of God in a cloud of fire, we already have, is leading them towards, so it's in front of them. And right in front of them is the Red Sea. So the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus, it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. So that was already an evening. They slept all night. There was such a dark cloud on one side that God is putting on the Egyptians. They cannot see anything. And warmed fire on the other side where the Israelites are and standing in between. So another story we can see God can engage in such type of circumstances and putting another form of a hedge, although this type is a cloud for the one and a fire for the other. Second Kings 6, 15 and 17. Now, this is the story where, again, chariots of fire, Elisha, has already inherited twice the amount of the Holy Spirit from Elijah. And there is an attack by the Syrians. You remember probably the story that it's attacking the Israelites, trying to destroy them. And there is this situation when um, the story is actually when the king of the Syrians is always trying to do something, but God gives information right away to Elijah and they know what the plan is. And right before this, these verses, if you wanna go second Kings chapter six to look, it's uh, where the advisors of the Syrian kings are telling him, we cannot do anything. Whatever we do, the God of Elisha, it tells him what happens in your bedroom. He knows everything. And the soldiers go and they'll say, okay, let's go and get that man, the man of God and see what happens. And when the servant of the man, that's the, the man of God, Elisha, 
arose early and went out. So they're sleeping in their, in their house, surrounding the city and, and with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. So there are chariots from the Syrian army surrounding the city. But now all around Elijah, we have chariots of fire with horses. And obviously these are angels from the God's army. So another situation where we see there is a battle. There is a rules of engagement, obviously, that allow these chariots of fire to be visible. Of course, they, they don't need to be visible, but they are there. Um, Luke 22, 31 and 32 is um, also interesting uh, story. Uh, that's when um, Jesus is telling this, his disciples that he's going to go to the cross. He needs to die. And uh, he's telling them, uh, one of you will betray me. That was in the time of, uh, of, the, of the upper room when did the, um, uh, they were eating in the upper room. So what Simon Peter was saying, if you remember, he's saying, I will never betray you. Or I will come with you even to death. And that's what Jesus is telling him. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. So this is one of the times that we see prayer actually intervenes in this battle and through the rules of engagement, because we see later in uh, Jesus' words, if you read them a little bit carefully, you will see that it doesn't say if. The verses don't say, if you return to me. It says when, when you return to me. So it, uh, that's why I put these verses. They are very important, I think, to me. is because they show it's just a matter of time. So if God has prayed for you, or if you have prayed for someone, we don't know exactly how long the rules of engagement will start applying in a specific situation or whatever we pray for, but it's just a matter of time. How much time? We don't know, but it's not if. If we have to remember something is that it's not if, it's when. The problem is that because we don't know when, we get wearied, we don't have the perseverance, we don't have the persistence or in other ways, some people go, call these prayer warriors that actually have realized how important this is. It's a matter of time. How much time? It depends on the situation, but we don't know. So when, when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. And we know what happened later. Of course, um, he went after Jesus. He rejected him three times when the... Uh, Jesus later told him that when the uh, crow, you know, in the morning, yeah, you will, you will betray me three times. He gets crushed, but later he meets them back on the, on the shore. And he is reaffirming his faith again. That's after the resurrection. When they are fishing, because Jesus is dead, what else we can do? Go fishing, you know. Let's go fishing. And Jesus meet them on the shore and, of course, tells them, hey, put your nets on the left side or on the right side. They cannot recognize who he is. They come up. He already cooked the fish. And he affirmed him three times again. So how long did it take? Well, it was more than a week. Well, I mean, it could have been right after, but at least around a week. I mean, Jesus had to die, get resurrected. So Thursday... He's being in the, we don't need to go through the timeline. The point is that it took some time. And a few more verses here talking about that. Psalm 34, 7. The angel of the Lord then comes all around those who fear him and delivers them. So this is one of the rules of engagement. It's 
the ones that fear him, if you fear him, the angel of the Lord will come around you. And we have other verses that talk that every one of us has a, an angel. Jesus told to his disciples, if you don't convert like these little ones, and later he tells them that each one of these little ones, their angels, watch the face of God in heaven. So everyone has their own angel. Um, Jude 9, another story. We go through uh, Moses. And this is Jude 9. Of course, Jude is one chapter. Verse 9 says, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Very interesting rule of engagement where God has, he can actually rebuke Satan for something that we believe for, for a person that he actually, uh, God wants to save. And we know the story that Moses, I think we even discussed a little bit in Sabbath school or before some of the previous Sabbath school, what happened to Moses right before the getting into the promised land he, from the meekest man on earth, suddenly uh, he lost his meekness just for a moment. And uh, God said, I cannot let you in. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't right. I mean, really, it wasn't right for God to let him in. But that doesn't mean that God rejected him completely. We know that he took him on the mount, showed him the promised land, told him, here, I'm showing it to you. And of course, Moses um, God did a funeral for him. Um, I don't know. Moses was already very old. We don't even know. I mean, more than 120 years old. But God buried him there. But with this, we see that actually God can rebuke Satan and says, I don't care what you say. I am claiming him because he's mine. And he took him. But it, there is a very important point in this specific story that I have a few more verses to show is um, what can actually break this connection and to not let God use the rules of engagement to help us, to surround us with angels, to answer our prayers, even if we have prayed a long time. And if you remember what the story was, I mentioned it is he got angry. It's very interesting but I never thought about it before. Why is anger such a big deal? And you have to go to the Mount of Blessings where you remember when Jesus talked about that, if you tell your brother Raka, which is the word today, it's stupid, just telling uh, your brother stupid. And nowadays, sorry to tell you, and I'm one of those people that I, every day I have to pray for this. It's, uh, we live in a world that uh, common sense has disappeared. So it's just, I'm sorry, but God doesn't like that. I mean, if you're not angry at them, if you say, ah, he's just stupid, maybe that's fine. But if you are angry with your brothers, then you are opening the gate and it's in the rules of engagement for God not able to intervene. And uh, Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 is one of the verses, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your wrath, nor give place to the devil. So what is anger doing is have given place to the devil. And uh, uh, why it's important is because Moses, the meekest man on earth, by his account, I mean, I don't know if anyone else has it, but we believe him at first, right? We believe Moses, that he was the meekest. He was not able to enter into the promised land. I mean, he had to skip it. Of course, he got a bigger reward, but hey, he got angry. And look what happened. He gave place to the devil. And how we know that? Because in Jude, Jesus had to dispute with the devil on this. Practically, what we see is that because Moses got angry, Satan says, uh-uh, you can take him. But what did Jesus say? Well, he disputed. We don't know exactly the conversation, but let's believe that he was claiming the future death, fulfilling of the promise of Jesus dying on the cross, that 
uh, he's forgiven. And obviously we know that Moses must have asked for forgiveness. I mean, he's not gonna, he's not gonna get this treatment by God for his anger. And um, there is another very interesting thing that I, interesting when I start searching for these, you find so many important points. Matthew 6, 9 to 15, we all know this um, prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So first clue about anger. So when do you need to forgive? If someone offended you, you need to forgive them. So someone got angry at you. You may know the story. You may not know. You may know the reason. Why is he angry at me? You ask forgiveness. But what's the other reason you can you need to forgive? Is you got angry. Someone not just offended you, but you got angry with him. And it continues a little lower. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. If we see right here, exactly in God's prayer, is this foothold that do not give space to the devil when you get angry or when you go into temptation, when you sin, then the devil has access to you. And that's kind of matches with the sermon of before that uh, Professor Mujia was talking. He was talking exactly the reason when a prayer should be answered. And one of them was keeping his commandments, not have any sin. Continue, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. And if you see, forgive, forgive, forgive. Debts, twice, forgive debts. Temptations that the devil can put us into. Two things. And three, forgive again. People's trespasses. So anger and forgiveness are very important because in the battle, in the rules of engagement, in the heavenly battle between devil and, and God, this is very important because Satan now can have access, can say, he is mine. I mean, he said it about Moses. So uh, there is another story. I'm, I'm just going to pass through it. This is the, uh, again, Another thing, um, we mentioned it before, that's the child that was being uh, taken out by this devil. And uh, we can read a little bit um, of the story, but um, I will just tell it to you so we don't spend too much time. Matthew 17 talks the, the time when Jesus with the three disciples went to the Mount of Olives to pray for, and uh, he showed himself in his glory to the three disciples, to the loved ones, John, Peter, and uh, James. He showed himself and coming down, the rest of the disciples having problem with this child who is supposedly epileptic when the devil doesn't want to come out. And then Jesus tells them that comes only through prayer uh, and uh, fasting. So why prayer and fasting? I mean, first, we don't know. We don't know the details. Obviously in the rules of engagement in the battle, there are some evil angels that just, they're not going to move. So you will not need just prayer. You will have to add fasting. So this is now another thing that we know, one of the weapons that you can add fasting. But there is another thing in the story. Before they were going down and waiting, while they were waiting down on the mountains, on the foot of the mountains, for the rest of the disciples and Jesus come down, there is the story before that they were arguing among themselves who's going to be the um, um, biggest in the kingdom of heaven. So another thing you see, pride. <laughs> what is this? The, uh, the prayer. Do not lead us into temptation. So first of all, they did not pray. Of course, they didn't know. Even that when God sent them, he told them, I'm giving you power over the evil spirits. And... And, you know, you can trample on scorpions and all these other things to, to resurrect. They were even able to resurrect. They were still arguing among themselves. And that was one of the other reasons. We see they had pride among themselves. So uh, let's read a few 
passages from uh, uh, different books. I, they are very clear kind of explaining this whole situation. Uh, there is no such thing as our entering the heavenly portals through indulgence and folly, amusement, selfishness, but only by constant watchfulness and unceasing prayer. Spiritual vigilance on our part individually is the price of safety. Swerve not to Satan's side a single inch, lest he gain advantage over you. Again, we see the same story. If you are falling into, I mean, falling into temptation, it's not sin, but submitting into it, being proud, being angry, something is happening. Now the devil has access and has a foothold and he can actually jump over the hedge that God has built through his angel, angels, angels of fire, whatever that could be, whatever protection God has given us. Second Chronicles 7, 14, kind of going to the persistence and the prayer again. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, they will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and hear and heal their land. That's a very popular verse that we use. It's only almost everywhere where you read about prayer in the books of prayer, you will see this verse. And it's again, if you think of the context, you will see, pray, seek God, humble yourself, turn from the wicked ways so you don't open a door from the hedge for Satan to claim things in your environment. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins. I will heal their land. I will answer your prayers. And uh, one of the most interesting stories about the delay is Daniel. We're not going to go over the whole story. I only put uh, two verses here. Remember Daniel prayed, that's chapter 10, to understand the vision. That was uh, the, one of the second visions. Well, actually, I think that was the third, when he actually prayed a lot, but he didn't receive understanding right away. So the angel comes to him. Three weeks later, I think we mentioned it in Sabbath school this morning too. We talked about that exactly, about the delay. So uh, verses 12 and 13, do not fear, the angel says, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia, which stood me 21 days and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, come to hear me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. So later on, of course, and I mean, he tells what the story is, right? This is, we know later that that's probably Angel Gabriel coming to reveal him. But the interesting point here is that from the first time you have prayed, they have heard the prayer. God has heard the prayer from the first day. And uh, we know that that was 21 days. He says that he didn't eat uh, uh, his favorite cake. He didn't eat chips, um, other pleasant food. I mean, yes, he doesn't give that much details, but he was fasting. Obviously, maybe he wasn't total fast with no eating at all. And uh, But he stayed away from wine, which is grape juice, stayed away from special foods, nice foods that he loved, uh, chips, ice cream, none of those things probably drinking water and maybe juice once in a while, three weeks. So from the first day he was hurt, but what happens? The angels tries to go, but there is another battle that he needs to battle, the Prince of Persia, and even that he couldn't do. So it's very similar to the story with the disciples. We have this demon that's throwing the child in the fire and cannot, cannot leave him, only fasting in prayer and Daniel is even fasting and praying already, but still he had to ask help from Michael, one of the chief princes, and we know what Michael stands for in the Bible in so many places. We don't need to do a Bible study on this. That Jesus himself comes to help him. It takes three weeks. And still, why does it take so long? Why? Obviously, that was a a big battle. I mean, uh, whatever battle it was, probably it wasn't a physical battle. <clears throat> Maybe they had to converse, but that was probably very specific with the rules of engagement. 
they probably was going back and forth. And now I'm interpreting on my own, of course, speculating on the verse. But with all the context that we see, that's probably they were discussing with that demon who was restraining the prince of Persia, who telling him, you can, you can do that. No, you cannot do that. Yes, I can. No, you cannot. You can go to Daniel. No, you cannot go to Daniel. You cannot tell him what the story is. I mean, it's going to be a right interpretation. So I have a few more passages. Uh, I don't think we have any more time, but I'm just going to read a few. By this, we see that heavenly agencies have to contend with hindrances before the purpose of God is fulfilled in its time. The king of Persia was controlled by the highest of all evil angels. We know who that is. He refused, as did Pharaoh, to obey the word of God. Gabriel declared he withstood me 21 days by his representations against the Jews. But Michael came to his help, and then he remained with the king of Persia, holding the powers in check, giving right counsel against evil counsel. And I'm not going to read there a lot of, I put uh, very interesting passages. Um, just going to read one more. God and evil angels are taking a part in the planning of God in his earthly kingdom. It is God's purpose to carry forward his work in is there trying to counterwork his purposes. Only by humbling themselves before God can God's servants advance his work. Never are they to depend on their own efforts or on outward display for success. So again, I mean I put too many passages, but I believe we see why the delays happen and why we should not be wearied or we should not be worried, but continue to pray. And if you start going through the Bible and looking at those examples, you will see that just there is no other way. Some cases are more difficult than others. Some cases God will answer right away. Other cases, God will need more time. But no matter how much time it's needed, we know what it's needed. If you humble yourself, Second Chronicles, in front of God, stay away from evil, then God will intervene. Amen. Uh, let's have a closing song. Please stand for our closing. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to be here. We thank you for your mercy and grace toward us and giving us a glimpse of how the great controversy works. Pray for you to teach us and guide us on how to become prayer warriors like the Eucharist is teaching and not to worry about the outcomes, but to know that you are there, you're ready to answer so we can be your people. Amen. Go to lunch.